So welcome, everybody, to the fifth session. I can't believe it's five already, but here we are of the Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar at the University of Iowa on textual and cultural exchanges, the manuscript across pre-modern Eurasia. So today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Friedrich and Shoshana Gulashi. Uh, Professor Friedrich will be speaking to us this morning. He is the director of the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg, which is uh, a leading international institute for comparative manuscript studies. So it's very good that he can join us here because they are working on precisely the sorts of questions that we're exploring all year. So uh, Professor Friedrich's main fields of research include Chinese Buddhism in the context of Chinese intellectual history, in particular, the formative period up to the sixth century, and the historiography of Chinese Buddhism in modern and contemporary China. So please join me in welcoming Professor Friedrich. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation and for these kind words. Um, it's an honor to be here and uh, to be part of this uh, exciting lecture series. And um, I'm very grateful to Professors Billy, um, uh, Barrett and uh, Takao and also to uh, Dr. Morton who have not only invited me but uh, to have made it possible for me to come even though sometimes it was difficult and the reasons were not on your side, I know that. So thank you very much. Um, what to expect uh, since uh, I was given 60 to 75 minutes um, and uh, we were confronted with a whole array of questions uh, and we were also encouraged to have a bit of what we are just working on. I decided to give you a mixture of uh, both. So first of all, some of the work uh, we are doing in uh, Hamburg, and I call this new trends in manuscriptology. Some of them are not so new, but some of them might, might be rather new. Then uh, the center, ancient and medieval Chinese manuscripts, and some later ones I think we should look at in this context. Finally, interactions of Chinese and other book forms. We will have, uh, I'm very happy that uh, Susanna uh, Kodachi is here today, and uh, I will not be interfering with your topic, and I will also not interfere with what uh, Dr. Susan Whitfield from the International Dunhorn Project will tell you, so I'm going to a side area, but uh, nonetheless, I think this might be relevant. So, let's start. What you see here uh, are photos of two manuscripts unearthed in 1973 in the southern Chinese province of Hunan at Mawangwe. The tomb was closed in 168 BCE. The manuscripts, therefore, must predate them, but it is far from clear uh, how uh, long. Both of them are so-called multiple text manuscripts, that is, they carry more than one text. Both have the Taoist classic Lao Tzu. For this reason, the manuscripts are called Lao Tzu A and B. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of articles discussing variants and other philological questions, paleographic problems, matters of transmissions, uh, transmission and the genesis of the received Lao Tzu text, but only a handful looking at the manuscript as such, as codicological units. Let us therefore forget for a moment that we would like to know what is written there and examine first how it is written. This concerns aspects which are not represented in traditional editions, and so I just uh, listed them here very briefly, and uh, you see that they are quite different. Uh, if you look at the height, uh, we have one foot, 23 point something uh, centimeters uh, in A, two feet double uh, in B. The one was rolled in the tomb, the other one was folded. Um, the first one, sorry, I start with the second one. The second one, B, has markers for textual units uh, above uh, the frame, the text field, uh, and its square. And the other one has, um, as you see here, has below the frame, has dots. Uh, so uh, even in this respect, they differ. Uh, they have different types of script. Uh, one has no paratext, uh, A, uh, and the other one does have them. It's uh, the number of characters, its titles, and things like that. Uh, the first one, taboos the emperor, uh, the then emperor, maybe uh, it doesn't taboo it, but at least it's very impolite towards this first emperor in mentioning his personal name. And the second one does it. Uh, and then uh, for the first one, we have the Lao the first. For the second one, it's at the end. And uh, for the first one, we have four 
more or less confusion texts. I will not go into this. Uh, my synological colleagues would uh, say, no, it's very complex. It is. And in the other one, we have Taoist texts. And again, it's not only Taoist texts. It's very complex, of course. But basically, we might separate this. There are other features as well. Even without discussing matters of content, it will have become clear that these two manuscripts contain a rather special relationship. There are so many aspects mirroring each other that mere chance might be safely ex excluded. To resume, the two Laozi manuscripts may represent an extreme case, but nonetheless show that it is worth the while to study the material features of a manuscript before entering into editorial or interpretative business. Just one more detail. Scholars have been discussing a certain variant in the Laozi text of scroll A as a variant of the Laozi text only. Many texts on that scroll. Um, uh, but close examination of all texts of scroll uh, A shows that there is at least one more instance where the uncommon variant appears in a hitherto unknown text at the place where we would expect exactly the same character as in the received Laozi. In other words, a variant which has been considered a variant of a text, it's not a variant of the text, but it's a variant for the whole scroll, for all of the text. In the end, text-related phenomena might be manuscript-related. And this means that even while studying only one text of a multiple text manuscript, so MTM we used to say, it's necessary not only to look at the other text associated with it in the artifact, but also to scrutinize the physical object in itself. I would like to briefly introduce an approach to studying manuscripts. I said that new trends, um, which is not, of course, completely new, but to the best of my knowledge, has not been pursued systematically up to now, at least uh, not in all of the disciplines concerned namely those covering the greater part of humankind. If you think of uh, the number of extant manuscripts from Asia and Africa, uh, if I may, um, conservative estimates uh, say at least 10 million uh, objects, and many, many of them, especially in India and Africa and Southeast Asia, have never been catalogued, and they are rotting uh, in some strange place. So that is a huge part of human uh, heritage which uh, awaits uh, first uh, safeguarding and then study. Manuscript cultures, um, uh, of course, uh, is a broad topic. Um, I would like just to mention here that uh, some scholars call a holistic or integrative approach manuscriptology, and I will just use it uh, in this way. If you have questions, uh, maybe we can discuss this afterwards. Some basic concepts, uh, then, I would like um, to discuss some topics which are relevant not only for Chinese manuscripts, but uh, for perhaps manuscripts in a comparative or systematic perspective. I will base, of course, most of what I'm saying on my own expertise from the sinological field, but in our center we have had a close cooperation with many scholars. We are roughly 50 now um, from all almost all fields relevant, not all, but many fields. And so when I say we, uh, I include uh, the whole group. So it's not pluralis maestatis or pluralis modestatis, it's a real plural. Um, the state of the art, and this is important when I come back to the Chinese uh, materials, um, is very eve uneven. While in and for Japan, Japan, Japanese and Western uh, European manuscripts, we have a well-established tradition of research. Uh, other manuscript cultures have only recently come to the attention of scholars. For example, uh, African manuscripts or Southeast Asian manuscripts where they are still in an infant uh, state. First of all, uh, we might ask the question, what is a manuscript? Uh, this may, of course, be <laughs> a bit uh, surprising, but uh, when taking a closer look, it is not as easy anymore to answer it. The Oxford Dictionary of 1989, after explaining the Latin etymology of the word, which, as you know, means written by hand, gives as basic meaning, I quote, a book, document, or the like, written by hand. The writing of any kind is distinguished from printed matter, unquote. Please note the innocent phrase, writing of any kind is distinguished uh, from printed matter. I will come back to this uh, in a few Philologists, that is people studying or, uh, as we might say, loving texts, until today are used to say that they are editing a manuscript. Uh, I don't know about the English world, but in German, uh, ich editiere ein Manuskript. Um, clearly, what they mean by manuscript here is not the physical object, but the text. Usually a work which is represented or instantiated in one material object. The carrier medium or writing support traditionally is not what they are interested in. Traditionally, of course, we have many scholars here uh, who are very much interested in manuscript technologies, as I learned. 
Um, but when looking back, uh, one uh, might still be able to say that mainstream philology has been uh, closely looking at the text and rather uh, neglecting um, the, the material support. When editing the work of an author, the historical instantiations with all the variants and differences are said uh, in the language of the 19th, 19th century to corrupt the text. In other words, the work composed by an author at a certain point of time is handed down to the follow following generations by copying it in writing. Um, let us exclude orality, that's a different and uh, complex topic. And the copying process leads to a growing number of deviations from the original. The genuine task of the philology consists in clearing up this mess, uh, removing the corruptions covering the original like mildew, undoing uh, the historical process of transmission and returning to the original text of the author. This method, uh, called stomatological by the philologist, philologist, has been applied even before modern times to authorial texts not only in Europe but also in China, um, but it became a methodological tool only in the course of the 19th century. Of course, uh, especially in the field of classics, uh, I see Professor Dilly somewhat frowning. Uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, uh, this has been um, supplanted by a much more variegated and much more complex approach. But uh, just to highlight the basic idea behind it, um, uh, I would like to go back to this. Uh, and it works quite well in cases where we have one author and where we have a will to preserve, uh, let's say, the text of an author. Um, under the impact of postmodern thought, this approach was fundament fundamentally questioned. In uh, the 90s, scholars of medieval French literature, such as Stephen G. Nichols, started talking about new philology, material philology, or even materialist philology, um, proclaiming to take into account what they called the materiality of the manuscript. A few years earlier, in 1987, the French medievalist Paul Zumthor had discussed the concept of mouvance, uh, that is, the movement of text or textual blocks in medieval manuscripts, um, which is called fluidity of text nowadays, and which, of course, uh, refers to a different genre, to different genres, not to Plato or Aristotle, but to, to sometimes anonymous uh, text. And this was quite influential in West European literary studies. The French linguist Bernard Cerquiligny in 1989 published his polemic in praise of the variant, claiming that variants are part and parcel of manuscript transmission and that modern editions do not deal adequately with them when trying to eliminate them. As one of our colleagues, uh, Eva Wilden, she is a Tamilist, uh, has said in an unpublished lecture, um, uh, it helps to turn the traditional way of looking at things around. If the variants of a text are not considered uh, as corruptions, as deviations anymore, but are seen as the unfolding of the text in history, then even while accepting that there were authors and authorial texts, one may study these uh, deviations from an original as the social and cultural history of the text as embedded in material uh, instances. The traces left intentionally or unintentionally by the scribe testified to the meeting, one might say, in a certain sense of mind and matter, because the individuality of a scribe is always expressed in his handwriting and uh, the way a manuscript is conceived. The contributions of these postmodern authors to theory and scholarly practice were quite heterogeneous, but uh, there are two points, as far as I see it, which they have in common. First of all, they have contributed to the concept of materiality, but only rarely looked at the material evidence. Uh, Stephen Nichols is an exception. Uh, he is talking always about this matrix uh, drawing in art history, but uh, in the end, it's still the text which is uh, their main concern. And if there is something they might be uh, that might be helpful for interpretation, they will take material evidence. But uh, the text is the starting point. Despite their revolutionary devotedness to materiality, their main concern, uh, as I just said, has been the text. This has been the main approach in many of our fields, too. Uh, as I just said, we are used to speak of representations or instantiations of a text in some support or uh, carrier medium. This is without doubt perfectly legitimate, uh, even without raising the theological question where the text instantiated is when all its instantiations have gone. But if taken the materiality of text seriously, one will have to go one step further and take the concrete materiality of each manuscript as a physical object into account. 
depending on the individual manuscript. Uh, this includes, I hope I get the right one, yes, I might use that, the writing supports uh, that may be birch bark, uh, palm leaf, bamboo paper, parchment, and so on. The writing materials, I give you a chart from our uh, material science group, um, which is not only ink and pigments, but also the writing implements and uh, uh, everything which, which is related somehow to the production of the material object. And then, of course, um, the forms. Um, uh, usually, uh, we, we tend to call a book, uh, a certain type of book, book format, but uh, Peter Gumbot, uh, the Latinist of you will know him, he has passed away a few weeks ago, or two months ago, roughly. And um, uh, he has created the term uh, form in order to, to distinguish it from uh, the format. How big is it? Is it a square or a rectangle or whatsoever? And um, the visual organization, part of which uh, is layout or mise en page and things like that. Type of script, execution of writing, bookend versus, versus casual and others. The producer or producers of a manuscript in many cases can choose from different options. Type of script the way of writing, layout, the material, writing material, the form. And their choices are usually determined by cultural patterns as well as individual decisions. Then and only then it makes sense to mention, for example, the measurements of a text field or the number of lines on a folio, namely in relation to possible other decisions for producing the artifact. It's very interesting that you have uh, scholars from the literary studies field which, uh, when they use manuscript evidence, they give you all the codicological uh, evidence, so then they have done their work and they return to business as usual. So uh, I think this is very important information, but only uh, in, in, in a group or in, in a certain sample, um, because otherwise, um, well, it doesn't mean so much. What does it say? The manuscript is 21 and not 18 centimeters. A recent and more radical example is the revival of uh, manuscript uh, culture in Sipsong Banna, which is called Sichuan Banna in, in, in China nowadays. The People's Republic of China integrated the former kingdom of a Dailu-speaking group into its state and modernized not only their way of living, but also the Dahama script they had been using for their sacred scriptures of Buddhism and secular writing, thereby more or less wiping out traditional manuscript culture, which was active until... Uh, well, roughly middle of the last century. After the so-called Cultural Revolution, members of the old generation who still knew the Dharma script, which is much more complicated than the one they are using now, started to produce manuscripts again in which they transmit, among others, their traditional chronicles, usually with additions be, uh, going up to the present day. So uh, I apologize for the poor quality, um, but this is very recent and uh, our colleague working on that, uh, he's, still, he's going there every year and he's bringing uh, specimen which are produced today. So this is flourishing in a certain sense. How long is unclear. The focus on the concrete object has also led to an intense cooperation between uh, scholars and scientists. Just take this example, uh, of course, Professor Dilly, we have been talking about that, is using multispectral imaging as well. Uh, this is a very nice uh, palimpsest where uh, you have music uh, a century older below um, the, some boring uh, track. Uh, we have lots of, of them. So um, it's, uh, there are many other ways to analyze uh, the material objects from a scientific point of view. It's not only imaging. This is the most spectacular one, but uh, you can use chemical analysis, uh, trace, trace elements, and uh, if you look at uh, the isotopes, you may be able to, 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 to define where a certain pigment has come from and things like that, and we should do more of this, I think. These and some other considerations uh, have led to a de definition of manuscript trying to overcome the reduction to writing support on the one hand, on the other hand being as general as possible in order to include all types of manuscripts from different cultures. So I read it out, a manuscript is an artifact mm, planned and realized to provide surfaces on which visible signs are applied by hand. It is portable, self-contained and unique. It will differ from what you usually read about manuscript. It's usually mixed up with book, and in many cases it's unclear, is a manuscript a text, or, or what is it actually? Uh, we have a young scholar who collected only from the European field. He's a classicist. He's doing Greek and Byzantine manuscripts. He collected, I think, only in the major Western languages, uh, almost 50 definitions of book or manuscript. And it's on our website. You can check it. And it's it's uh, amazing. It it's really seems that people are very unclear about uh, what actually is a book or what is a manuscript. 
This definition includes, as you will notice, not only so-called literary manuscripts, which usually are the starting point of our works, um, but almost uh, all other handwritten portable artifacts, with the exception of tattoos, labels of objects, and some other objects with handwriting. It thus includes, and this is of some importance, documents of all kinds, administrative, legal, and others. These have usually been completely taken out of uh, our concern, and in many areas, uh, this might not be to the uh, best of uh, our state of knowledge. Certain things, um, uh, I would say, for at least ancient Chinese manuscripts can only, if you look at, uh, at, at, at literary manuscripts, can only be understood if you look at uh, handwriting, the production of handwritten objects in general. And uh, as I learned by our Byzantine scholars mm, uh, in, in the Imperial Palace in, in Constantinople, uh, the, the archival documents were kept in the library. So uh, obviously not in all cultures, we have this clear cut uh, distinction, which has informed our study um, during the last centuries. In short, a manuscript may be considered as a complex material object with different layers of meaning. The choice of material features constitutes a first level, while the text or any other types of signs, I just showed you a musical uh, manuscript, so notation, musical notation, also is part of manuscripts. We have uh, images, diagrams, uh, lots of uh, other things. Um, while this text or this writing is materialized in this layer constitutes a second one. Using a Saussurian metaphor, one might say that both are inseparably welded together like the two sides of a sheet of paper, or significant and signifié, as you know. The relationship in this case, however, being an extremely complex one, not only because two aspects of science or two signs, but between two sets of signs. So uh, I think we should maybe look more into this. A manuscript without writing would only be a manuscript in potentia, and without its material support, the text would not survive its immediate mental or oral realization. Generally speaking, the manuscript as an artifact, as physical object, has been traditionally, uh, looking again to Professor Dilly, neglected. And um, although, of course, catalogers, codicologists, paleographers have always studied the material uh, appearance of uh, writing supports. But it is no accident that these disciplines traditionally are called ancillary. So uh, they are not uh, a discipline in their own right. They just uh, they are serving uh, the higher disciplines. With the exception of European medieval art history, which always paid attention to the material features of manuscripts, all but exclusively, almost exclusively, on those of luxury items, the philological disciplines um, only uh, slowly um, discover the potential of this approach. Just one example concerning what we call visual organization. So that's taken from, from uh, the Islamic world. You see three different types of manuscripts of the Qasidat al burda a very popular poem in praise of the Prophet written by a certain al-Busiri in the 13th century when he was struck by paralysis. Muhammad appeared to him in a dream, wrapped him in a mantle, burda that's the title of this Qasida, and when he awoke, he could walk again. This poem is recited until today all over the sunny Muslim world. According to the research of Friederike Daub, the different book forms correspond to different uses of the manuscript. Type 1 arranges uh, the text in a block without further differentiation. Type 2 clearly divides the half verses by a blank space, sometimes even adding elements uh, such as frames, separation marks, or subtitles. Type 3, finally, is usually small-sized and gives only one half verse per line. As Daub has shown, these three types probably correspond, correspond to three types of use. Type 1 was in use until the 16th century and was primarily meant for transmission of the text and its history, since in many of the manuscripts an account of, its, uh, of it is prefaced to the poem. Type 2, by clearly marking the half-verses since the 16th century, seems to have served other purposes such as reading or edifying. And uh, this is interesting because this type of dividing uh, verses uh, has been in use since the 11th century. So uh, in this, for this particular poem, it only uh, started becoming more popular much later. And type 3 became only popular in the 18th century. Manuscripts of this type are typically uh, pocket books and were most probably carried because of their healing and apotropaic effects. 
So one, would, uh, one might say that this, in a certain sense, to once again use metaphorically uh, the vocabulary of linguistics, that might be the semantics uh, of a manuscript and uh, not the semantics of texts or of, of, of writing, but only of the material, uh, only of the material um, aspects. So um, you might have seen that we call ourselves Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures. A few words more on manuscript cultures, and then finally I will arrive at uh, Chinese uh, manuscript cultures. The term manuscript cultures has been used for decades as antonym of book culture. Book, manuscript. While the latter is used for the culture of the printed book since the spread of typography in Europe, the former is supposed to be its precursor, a somewhat imperfect state of written culture. Marshall McLuhan and his successor still used it this way by popularizing the idea of a monogenetic, homogeneous, and teleological development of media. What is significant here is the fact that the term manuscript culture is traditionally used in the singular. It is the manuscript culture as contrasted with the book culture. So one is handwritten, the other one is printed. This has changed, fortunately, at least in many of our fields, where uh, we talk about uh, manuscript cultures in the plural and um, not only looking at it from uh, the backside in a somewhat anachronistic way. In order to avoid the pitfalls of interpreting history as a te teleological process, in this case with a quite regional outcome, we have tried to look at the concept not as an antonym to modern Western printed book culture, but as comprising many different historical phenomena in their own right. Asian and African manuscript cultures, for example, are clearly distinct from the Western European ones. We tend to talk about European ones, but actually we are mainly talking about Western European ones. There are not so many scholars studying, uh, let's say, Slavonic manuscripts or, or Eastern European traditions. And they thus provide rich evidence for testing the supposedly universal rules deduced from a regional or the very successful development. Furthermore, one should not consider manuscripts as precursors of printed books only, which is done until this day in the field of the history of the book, uh, as far as I am able to, 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 to see. Uh, but um, they should rather be uh, considered as progenitors of the uh, printed book, which preserves many traits of his handwritten predecessor. And, of course, one has to add, uh, I see many of you... Uh, producing manuscripts, you're taking notes. So uh, this cultural technique is still uh, very very much alive. And um, we even have, uh, you know that of course, in, uh, we have a new manuscript uh, culture, so to speak, with the invention of the author or the invention of the manuscript, as Christian Ben has called it, in the late 18th century. So why are we venerating uh, the manuscripts of, uh, in my case, it's mostly Kafka, Nietzsche, and all those uh, great thinkers, of course, or Guti and, and, and these. Uh, this is another culture related to the writ handwritten object. And what will come out of handwriting uh, when uh, this uh, digital uh, techniques proceed further, we don't know yet. As I've mentioned already, the study of manuscripts as artifacts owes inspiration uh, to the attempts by Nichols and others to go beyond purely textual research. Disciplines concerned with material objects in the first place have also struggled to find new approaches to their fields, history of science and technology, archaeology, and finally anthropology. They use the term, of, uh, they use the term material culture, and uh, I could give you a long lecture on that, but the interesting thing is, since 1996, I think, we have a, um, a journal uh, which is called Journal of Material Culture. And I haven't checked uh, before coming here, but the last time I checked, and this was, uh, I think, beginning of this year, um, there were two uh, articles on restoration practices, restoring uh, manuscripts, and otherwise, in the Journal of Material Culture, nothing about uh, manuscripts. And so this is uh, very interesting, and this is probably related to the fact that, um, let's say, anthropologists, there are exceptions to the rule, of course, but uh, anthropologists as a rule, uh, are not uh, philologists or, or historians of certain textual traditions. Methodological, some of their work, uh, I think, is still uh, relevant for, for what we are doing, but uh, this might be another topic. Mm. Just once more, uh, return to the uh, concept of manuscript culture, uh, because I think this frames somewhat uh, what, what I want to say afterwards. 
of course, everybody knows writing was invented probably around 3400 BC in Mesopotamia, and it has been largely handwriting until printing was invented in China around 700 uh, CE. So uh, I would very much love to discuss printing in China with you or in East Asia because this is related to intimately related to manuscript culture. Uh, we consider it not so much as a type of printing in the typographical way, but rather as an extension of manuscript culture. Uh, you will have uh, uh, Professor Barrett uh, from, from London, and he is the specialist on this, so I shut my mouth. Um, <laughs> However, handwriting continued to play the dominant role even in China at least until the 12th century, some scholars say until the 16th century, making its breakthrough, um, so that printing made its breakthrough roughly contemporaneously with the same phenomenon in Western Europe. But as has been shown again and again, even in Europe, the final demise of manuscript cultures only occurred in the course of the 18th century and gave birth to a new manuscript culture. Um, but I will come back for China uh, to, to the Chinese case uh, in a few minutes. The invention of writing took place in city-states with stratified societies. Whether it was always related to administration as in Mesopotamia is far from clear, just as the processes are unclear in which writing assumed different functions in more and more complex societies. Writing may spread to other regions and societies changing to other regions and societies, changing not only its outward appearance, but also its functions. It may be adopted for completely different languages, such as the cuneiform writing or the Chinese script, to mention only the two. It may play a central role or be the marginal domain of a small group of specialists. It always has an impact on the societies in which it is used. This impact is to be seen, as we know, in its capacity to store information and allow for its distribution across time and space independent from human agents. Since it has become clear that writing in traditional societies was still very much tied to orality and mostly um, played a secondary role in the transmission of texts ad memoir. That is to say that, of course, uh, we have this transmission uh, aspect to, to manuscripts, but there is much more. The production, storage, and use of manuscripts brought forth practices which go far beyond uh, sim their simply being a carrier medium. For the production of manuscripts, certain materials and implements are needed, uh, which in turn have to be produced. The necessity to teach writing uh, and reading may lead to the establishment of institutions responsible for that. If manuscripts are not only produced for one-time usage, there is need of space and personnel for storing and eventually copying the text, thus producing new manuscripts, etc., etc., etc. So uh, there is a whole uh, real complex behind this idealized, uh, let's say, uh, biography of a text, which is not new, of course, but uh, it's helpful to, to remind oneself, um, even when studying the history of one text. These aspects of manuscript cultures are well known, uh, and for some cultures, mainly the Western ones, uh, even well researched. An aspect much less understood is the relation between administrative manuscripts and so-called literary manuscripts. I just mentioned that we would uh, maybe uh, should, should give it a try, whether we not uh, might uh, have new insights when looking at them together. We have manuscript cultures without any administrative documents. But even in some societies with only marginal or elite literacy, traces of at least proto-administrative documentation can be found. For example, when important events are noted in the margins of religious manuscripts. We have this in Bible manuscripts of Ethiopia and many other places. And I think in Oslo has been a conference on that a couple of years ago. And I think the title was very telling, was the Bible as, note, uh, as a notebook. Uh, uh, will come out very soon, as far as I know. All these are related to what one might term knowledge practices. Manuscripts can play other roles as well. They serve as magical or ritual objects, or uh, may represent the wealth and status, sorry, um, uh, the wealth and status of their owner, rather than a knowledge tradition. And as some of you know, they are produced until the present day to generate religious merit in Buddhist traditions of Southeast Asia. I will return to an earlier part of that when coming, finally coming to China. These non-textual functions of a manuscript, uh, as a rule, still rely on its text. If a manuscript would not have the sutra, then of course uh, it would not be relevant uh, in, in this case. But um, the users usually don't even have to know what's written there. 
which does not exclude the possibility, of course, that the user is aware of its content. What I've outlined so far might be termed, you might expect this after I've been talking about the semantics of a manuscript, might be about the pragmatics. And uh, so uh, we have very many different um, uh, aspects, and I only repeat uh, the, the terms here, which I've used already. Finally, further differentiation in what we tend to call a manuscript culture should not be underestimated. It might be helpful for fu future study to f define a manuscript culture not by very general features such as language, for example, Latin, uh, script, cuneiform, or religion, we talk about Buddhist or Islamic or Christian manuscripts, but use a finer grid. The fine example is scholarly manuscript culture. Just look at this. Some of you might not be able to read anything uh, because of the poor quality of, of the slides, uh, of course, only. But you see, scholars tend to, uh, after a certain uh, stage of development, they tend to use every blank space to note down uh, their own thoughts, or they, they do excerpts or glosses or whatsoever. And we have uh, from the left to the right, the left one is a West African manuscript, I think, from the 17th century. The middle one is a Byzantine manuscript, and the right one is a Chinese manuscript from roughly 1600. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, manuscripts for use in ritual, as far as I know, never carry this type of notes if not being used in a scholarly context. Uh, instead, one often finds symbols or notes pertaining to the performance uh, of ritual uh, they were made for. And now, and this is the end of this part, uh, uh, one might try to define manuscript culture in the following way. A manuscript culture is the social and cultural context in which manuscripts are produced, used, and transmitted. This social and cultural context is in turn being shaped by the medium it produces. Thus, manuscript cultures are not necessarily identical with regional cultures or religious cultures. More than one manuscript culture may be found in a given place at a given time. For example, the manuscript cultures of an educated elite and of religious specialists. And this is the case for uh, East Asia, as far as I can uh, do have an overview. So uh, just to let you know, I don't uh, want to dwell on this. We have developed a sort of schema to, to integrate all possible uh, aspects uh, when studying manuscripts. Production and use will be self-explaining. Setting is, uh, to put it in a, very, uh, in, a, in a very small nutshell, setting is, so to speak, the social and economical hardware, and patterns are uh, is the, the, cultural, uh, the cultural information or informing uh, the production of manuscripts. Just one example, we have columns. Everybody knows what a column is, but uh, this, of course, is a nice uh, European manuscript which, where you have the reading direction. You first read one column from left to right, and then you take the second one. But we have other cultures. In uh, Sanskrit manuscripts, usually, uh, these columns are only done uh, to, to arrange the text, and uh, you do not read column by column, but uh, the text goes on. And uh, we have already seen in, in, uh, for, for manuscripts with verse in the, the Arab tradition, uh, of course, you have to read from right to left. Um, and these columns are what they call pseudo columns because they are not columns. Uh, they are only, they, they, uh, they, 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 they develop because you take the half verses apart. And so uh, from the outset, it looks exactly the same. But uh, you have to know this information, otherwise you wouldn't be able to read and understand the manuscript. So this would be a cultural pattern. So thanks for bearing with me. Now I finally arrive at uh, what I was asked to do. Um, ancient and medieval Chinese manuscripts. Um, of course, this is a huge topic. And as I said before, uh, you will have many specialists here. Uh, already uh, Professor Ulachi is here and will give you uh, nice introduction into this fascinating topic of money, Manichaean uh, manuscript production. And um, I will give you a rough overview, commenting on uh, stages of development, uh, hopefully of interest to you, taking this idea of manuscript technology uh, as the starting point. Mm. This is, of course, uh, something which you can read in, in uh, many books on, on Chinese manuscripts, but uh, recent developments have still made it uh, helpful to, to add maybe a few, few more points. So just very briefly, uh, right, the earliest specimens of Chinese writing we have stem from, let's say, the time roughly 1200 before. It's divinatory texts uh, which were inscribed or engraved on, on, uh, on turtle plastrons 
and on uh, animal bones. You have a specimen of both. So the writing is very unorderly, and this is, of course, it's hard. Maybe it's related to that. The second stage, so this is this is school book knowledge, I guess. But I have to comment on it because in the school school books sometimes uh, it's it's not the latest date. So what we have here is a bit later, the earliest one stem from the 11th century. It's uh, ritual uh, sacrificial vessels, and they are made from bronze. And not all of them, of course, but quite a large number. We have by now, I think, close to 10,000 of these inscriptions, and they uh, start 11th century BCE and then terminate roughly the uh, third century, fourth third century BCE. So the content is not so important. It's mainly uh, serving uh, to elevate the status of the one who uh, has commissioned them and to elevate the status of the ancestors. And we have some early examples of history writing, depending on what you like to define as history. And uh, usually it's deeds. So the king has uh, awarded someone for, for, for having won a battle and uh, has given him cowrie shells and slaves and, and other things. And so this is commemorated here and uh, by, by sacrificing food and other things, uh, the, the ancestors, uh, they will uh, get to know this. Interesting, by the way, that uh, if the food is placed in there, you usually cannot see the inscription. So uh, this is not for public display, uh, as some people think. Uh, excuse me, just one more thing. Um, usually you read um, that... Uh, uh, this is the second stage in the development of the Chinese script. This is rather unlikely. They take the oldest existing uh, specimen of writing uh, to be the oldest uh, type of Chinese script. And this is, of course, very dangerous because uh, archaeolo archaeological evidence is always uh, somewhat contingent, so so should be careful. And there are other scholars, and uh, I think they have good reasons, who say, no, uh, this uh, writing we find on the, in the oracle bone inscriptions, it's a rather special type, and this is not uh, uh, the, the general uh, way of uh, writing. And uh, on some of these uh, plastra, uh, we have found traces of ink. So um, uh, most people think there was already a brush, and uh, people might have written on bamboo and, and the other stuff. It's only it has not come down to us. And so this type of writing actually might have been much more closer to the original type. Uh, but this is just in brackets. So now we're coming closer to our manuscripts. Um, what you see here is, uh, is, of course, one of the nicest examples. We have here a wooden manuscript. And um, we have the same type in bamboo. Uh, I will come to, to the time frame and other things a little later on. Just to look at the technique, it's rather easy. You have slips, and they are uh, written on with a brush and ink uh, from the top down. What you have here is a list of items, and it stems from one of the, the, the military garnisons uh, in the northwest, uh, in, in what is today Gansu. And uh, we have unearthed uh, uh, tens of thousands of this, and they roughly date roughly uh, from the first century BCE until the second century CE. So it's rather early, and it's the dry climate, so uh, they survived this. And um, this is mainly, there are a few exceptions, but it's mainly administrative documents. And uh, you can use some of them to reconstruct uh, how the chain of um, command was in, in, in the early Chinese empire. Extremely interesting, very difficult, because many of them have been broken. You have to reconstruct them. And uh, so there is uh, still much more work. And uh, the Chinese archaeologists, uh, once in a while, uh, have new discoveries. So the corpus is growing. So that's one part um, of, of uh, writing. The technique is the same with bamboo manuscripts. And so whether it's an accident or not, probably not. Bamboo manuscripts were mostly found in the south, where we expect bamboo to be more uh, relevant than in the, in the north or northwest. And uh, these, these wooden uh, manuscripts uh, are found, as I just said, in the northwest of what is today China. But we have also wooden manuscripts in the south. Um, and uh, so this is something one should not uh, overgeneralize because uh, in the end it's not so much what we have. If you look at the map of China, it's huge, and uh, we do not have so many sites, archaeological sites, which have really yielded manuscripts. And so we still do not really understand um, why some of the tombs I will, talk in, uh, I will be talking about uh, have manuscripts uh, in them. And um, of course, these are hot founds. They were just thrown away, just other just like other administrative records. To give you a number, a figure which is might be interesting to you. 
um, uh, in the province of Hunan. That's where the manuscript was found I had at the beginning. Um, some years ago, they found uh, 30,000 uh, bamboo strips in a well, which were discarded. Uh, they found even more in uh, another well in the same province in Fuzhishan. They have not been published yet. And uh, there are other sites which have not been published. We have a number only from that province of administrative documents of more than 100,000 slips. It's a huge corpus and it's extremely difficult. The literary sources do not yield so much information. We didn't know much about administration and law. And so this is opening up a huge field now. And we slowly, slowly uh, start to understand uh, what was going on there. And by now we know a bit better uh, how uh, the production of these manuscripts and others were. Uh, just uh, once more returning to this, this is stationary. You could not only use something you find on the ground. So uh, the slips had to pre be prepared for wood. It was easier than for bamboo. Um, the bamboo slips, uh, they were usually uh, dried. Uh, it's not very clear how they did it. And then uh, sometimes they were bound together before being written on. Sometimes they're written on afterwards being bound together. That's uh, very difficult. We have a bit of a problem because these bindings usually uh, uh, are not excellent anymore. So they've gone, they've decayed or whatsoever. In a very few cases, you have traces of them and then you can uh, reconstruct. What is very interesting is that uh, uh, our colleague Enno Giele from Heidelberg University, he's more on, on the material side, so archaeology on that, he has done um, uh, experimental archaeology. He had a group of very uh, good uh, PhD students and some other colleagues, and they were getting together and trying to, do, to bind manuscripts. They didn't find any way. Either the slips uh, went through again, or it took them so long to tie them together, uh, that it didn't work or they did something which they could not handle because they could not roll it up or put it in sheets. So until the present day, to the best of my knowledge, we don't know how these were produced. Because uh, if you look at the sheer number, it must have been uh, a method which would not require too much labor. Uh, so this is one of the things. Um, then the size, I mean, uh, we have some rules uh, and we know that uh, only since the edition of a few manuscripts, uh, I think two years ago, there was even a, a ordinance, as it's called in synological uh, speak, uh, you could say a law, how to produce documents. Uh, depending on what's in there, the size is in there and a certain formula, so it's highly bureaucratic and it reminds me of uh, the administration of my university, to be honest. Um, but it's fascinating. And of course, one would always have to check, but uh, it, everything was regulated in this administration. It's in a certain sense, extremely modern. And so we slowly, uh, there emerges a new uh, image of that. And this, and uh, then I might close um, these remarks concerning the administrative documents. And um, this type of dealing with manuscripts, copying manuscripts, there was a whole procedure of copying manuscripts because if you have an administrative document, uh, you send it around, keep your copy for yourself. Or if you are at the highest level at the imperial court, everything which arrives there in, this, in, in the chancellery has to be copied and then uh, you have the incoming uh, thing left uh, at that uh, first um, uh, office and then the copies are proceeded and they are recopied again uh, depending on where they go when um, the imperial court has a ordinance or a law it is copied uh, for all the imperial offices and then it's handed down in the in the provinces and it's copied there again handed down to the prefectures and the prefectures is again handed down uh, to let's say military offices and and so on so it's a huge machinery we have to imagine here and this machinery must have been established in basis uh, in the third century bce so that means uh, when uh, Qin finally unified the empire it is interesting for literary manuscripts as well why uh, the first catalog of the Imperial Library was done in the first century uh, CE and, um, excuse me, BCE, it was started uh, shortly before zero. And uh, Liu Xiang, uh, some of you know him, of course, uh, and Liu Xiang was, which will be shown in a PhD dissertation uh, almost uh, completed by now, um, he copied uh, methods from the administration because. Uh, just give you one example, when someone in the lower echelons of administration, uh, they, they always had to go once a year to their superior office and copy the relevant laws. And there was a certain procedure to check that their text was uh, correct. And uh, even the vocabulary, which uh, our first librarian, our first cataloger is using, is coming from, from that field of administrative, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, proofreading, so to speak. And uh, so one might say, but um, we will know about will know more about that uh, very soon. One might say that uh, Chinese philology has been born out of administration. Um, yeah, not only, but uh, to, to quite an uh, impressive part. So there are other ways of uh, putting writing on something, seals and, and placards and uh, even wooden tablets. But I will not go into this just to show you and remind you that there is more than that. I just said that um, these slips were the most common uh, parts of producing, the most common uh, way of producing manuscripts. What you find here are three very famous manuscripts. It's uh, three fragments of the text I mentioned in the beginning, the so-called Laozi uh, or Tao Te Ting, uh, however it is uh, uh, done in, in Western translations. And you see here, the length is, of course, not correct. Uh, they, it ranges from 20-something to 30-something to centimeters. Uh, they were bound again. Uh, they may have been bound in two places or in three places or in four places. We have the largest, the longest slips we have are roughly 80 centimeters. And uh, that's, that's quite a bit, if you imagine. They have four bindings. And uh, one, may ask, one may ask, of course, what these manuscripts were used for. Because if you have it like this, it's not a copy where you uh, just leave through. So that's yet very interesting questions. These are smaller. We don't know what they were used for and how they were used. Uh, people have a uh, hypothesis, but it's not so clear. And um, in a comparative way, what we know about early manuscript cultures, usually, uh, the Greek case may be a bit different, but usually um, these, these uh, handwritten things are not so much meant for reading, studying them, but either for reading them out loud or having a copy for memorizing or, or things like that. And so there is, there is quite a bit of, of uh, necessity to do more research, but uh, some of the formats we have uh, do not uh, lend plausibility to the idea that they were meant for reading especially if you have these huge copies. We have uh, manuscripts with law texts um, in, found in some tombs. One of them is almost, uh, oh, what is it? I think it's almost four meters. And uh, it must have been such a heap of bamboo slips. And uh, it would almost be impossible to retrieve any information because there is no table of contents. And uh, so there are many questions concerning them. And some of these manuscripts, and this is becoming clearer and clearer, were probably produced for the tombs as a sort of, of, of burial uh, gift. Uh, but why, again, of course, is a different question. So uh, here you have literary uh, manuscripts, and you see uh, their, their codicological form is not in any way different from other ones. And we have uh, silk manuscripts. Only very few. Silk was very expensive, of course. And um, we have only very few. There were two found uh, early in the 20th century, but that's a long story, and they are rather exceptional case and uh, a huge tomb, and that was the one uh, I mentioned in the beginning. It's uh, actually, uh, I like that tomb very much because it's the richest uh, findings we have, a very complicated uh, ensemble, tomb ensemble. And uh, there were more than 30 silk manuscripts. And um, this is interesting in a codicological way, as you will see in a moment. I like that one. That's a text uh, um, uh, divinatory, and uh, they are talking about halos and certain phenomena in the sky. And it's usually related to military things. So if, if this comes up, then uh, your state will suffer or uh, you will be invaded and things like that. And this is uh, in a close up uh, the two manuscripts I showed you before. The color is not correct here, but um, the, the, it's an old one. They, they didn't have new productions um, of this. You see, you have a very nice layout. Um, uh, let's look at the right one. That's uh, type B, what I showed you in the beginning. You have a frame in black, and you have red lines uh, for the layout, which are to be filled afterwards. And the left one is a bit more, seemingly a bit more casual, but basically it's also done uh, the same way. And these are what some of us say philosophical text, one might call it uh, something else as well. And um, so no administration anymore. You have running texts and uh, it's literary text and uh, you have put them on silk. Um, uh, silk manuscripts and other as well, uh, there were two ways of storing them. One is to roll them and the other way is to fold them. And that's interesting again, I mentioned that in the beginning, only two of them uh, in this uh, particular case were folded excuse me, were rolled up, um, the other ones were folded. 
and for bamboo and, and wooden manuscripts, it's uh, more or less the same. You can roll them up or you, you put them in layers. In one tomb, you found them. They were put in layers like this, you, like this and like this then. And you, you can put them up. Um, of course, some of you know what that is. That's not silk, that's paper. If we, so uh, what did we have so, uh, so far? We did have uh, wood, bamboo, and silk as a prestigious, as a high class uh, writing support. Um, silk, we don't, don't have very much. Uh, I said that it's third, second century BCE. Not much reliable evidence for that afterwards, but that may be, again, archaeological evidence. We have um, wooden uh, manuscripts right until the fourth century uh, CE. So it was used for uh, these, these wood in the south bamboo. They continue to be used for, for administrative purposes. And the Japanese, they will give you uh, something else. They have mokkan. I don't know whether anyone has heard about that. So it's a known field of study. They have found, I think, 120,000 of those. It's a huge number again. It's later. Uh, but it's, of course, uh, taking over this, this way of producing manuscripts. Now, what happened? Um, uh, Professor Barrett knows much better than me, so uh, I will just say a couple of words. Um, history of paper is a, a very intriguing field because uh, the archaeologists in China always unearth new evidence. And so we have basically two hypotheses now. Um, Pan Jixing and other Chinese scholars, they say, we have paper already in the second century BCE, and some contest that, and they say, whoa, this is proto-paper or this is not real paper. And since I'm not a paper historian, uh, I refrain from commenting that. But it seems to be quite clear that what has been termed as proto-paper, or by some as paper, uh, was used for wrapping. So uh, paper was probably uh, invented for wrapping things. And then uh, there is one instance where they have the name of, a, of herbs on that. It might, uh, the idea might have been you wrap something and then, then write uh, on it uh, what's in there. And so that's one of the hypotheses. But it's a very complex field. Uh, whatever, in uh, 100 uh, CE, roughly, we have in uh, the official histories, we have mentioning of paper already. So it means at that time, it was, has already arrived at the court, and there must be some history before it. But when exactly, which year, which date paper was invented, uh, that's something uh, different. If you look at this one, it's a paper scroll, uh, 7th century from Dunhuang. Uh, Dr. Woodfield will give you all the information on Dunhuang, so I will not dwell on that. Um, it's the library cave number 17A, which was uh, opened uh, in, in uh, well, roughly 1900. And um, uh, the Europeans uh, have most of the stuff. London, uh, Paris, and St. Petersburg, and then the Japanese came, and a bit is left in China as well. So it's scattered all over the world, and uh, Susan Whitfield will introduce you to this and to the International Dunhuang Project. But this is a very nice specimen of a scroll. It's the Pragna Paramita Sutra, which is one of the most famous and most spread uh, Buddhist sutras. And if you look at it, uh, you see familiar things. You have the layout, the red uh, grid here, and um, I don't know how long this uh, paper scroll has been, but uh, they can be up to 12 or 13 meters. It is very uh, thin and very high quality paper. So um, uh, there has been a long way from the very rough uh, uh, rock paper and, and uh, hemp and rami, what, whatever they put in there, to this highly uh, uh, polished way. And <clears throat> uh, the interesting thing is actually that this is completely taking over what we have seen already in the silk manuscript. So we have a new writing support, but uh, the, the book form is seemingly taken over. And of course, uh, paper has even more qualities, uh, which make, makes paper good writing support than, than uh, silk. By the way, again, not my topic. You will uh, have Professor Barrett here. Um, if I may say so, the other <laughs> Professor Barrett. Um, by the way, uh, when people are talking about printing, uh, they always give you seals and whatever is necessary for it. Paper is the most important thing, because if you don't have paper, you cannot print. Try to print on parchment. There are a few uh, examples from Europe, but it's only a very, very small number. That's not the ideal way to printing. You need the right uh, support for that. So um, again, why are these important? They found thousands of them in, in the Stonehorn cave. And I mentioned before, um, to spread the word of Buddha gains you uh, religious merit in Buddhism. So 
whether you preach, you recite, or you copy, you gain merit. And that explains why many of these scrolls were not used. Obviously, and you have in, in, in other cultures, you still have that uh, custom, they were produced and the act of production gained you the merit. And it's in colophones, which are very interesting, but there's yet another topic. It always says, in order to spread the word of the Buddha, and then they rolled up and left uh, at the temple or monastery where they were copied. Um, in some cases, they were used, but many, many, many of these, especially the, press, the, the um, high-priced roads, they were obviously uh, either never used or only in rare cases because the, their condition is so good, uh, if you would use them regularly, you would have some traces. Uh, final point here is, Mm, this custom of, of copying uh, in the Buddhist sphere must have been so important that perhaps or probably, again, uh, scholars have different opinions, the, what we use today in Chinese as the word for writing uh, is taken from that period um, because uh, what we say for writing today uh, actually means uh, imitating, copying, modeling on. So this is just to give you another idea uh, concerning Buddhism. That is, uh, I have to confess, not Chinese, but Japanese, but they took over this custom from the uh, Japanese sphere. Uh, people in Cologne from the uh, East Asian Museum, they once did something you should not do. They dropped uh, very the statue, and then it broke open, and uh, they realized what's in there. And so many, many of Buddhist statues are filled with manuscripts. Again, uh, some of them must have been produced for these, and uh, so they probably were not meant for reading, but again, for generating merit and others. So let's uh, just uh, resume in a certain sense. That's our sutra. Uh, that's another nice manuscript, silk manuscript. Uh, of course, the char characters look a bit different, but the, the general thing is the same. That's another uh, manuscript, uh, administrative manuscript. By the way, these were done very uh, nicely. You could do files. What did they do if they proceed a document? Um, they would um, uh, the next uh, the next echelon. They, if they proceed, if they would produce a document related to that, they just would fix it to the left side. So they would grow uh, writing from right to left. They would grow uh, towards the left side. Very briefly, uh, and then I will come to my final point, which will not uh, take too long so that I hope to uh, stick to the uh, time frame which was allowed. <laughs> um, uh, the book forms are really very intriguing, which we find in, in, in Dunhuang, so uh, I leave that basically to, to, to Susan Whitfield, but uh, a couple of things might be of interest. Some of them are not attested to in the thousands or hundreds, uh, there are only a few. You know what the poti is, that's the palm leaf book basically. And um, we have that in, in Tibet and in paper, um, and it's this oblong uh, leaf. But we have uh, uh, this, this type of poti reproduced in paper and with Chinese writing. I mean, it's then read from, uh, from, from the top to the bottom, so it's different, but they still keep the whole, because these palm leaves, the, the, their binding, so to speak, was a thread through the holes and if you look at uh, what you have on the screen you see again that there was a hole or at least uh, uh, something uh, meant for putting a string through but it was probably never uh, strung together that's a funny thing anyhow because on the right hand you have chinese on the left hand something else so another type of book butterfly i will just give you a few examples um, that is seemingly and that's the reason why i put it here you, you might ask uh, Dr. Whitfield, she, she will give you um, more insights into that. Um, these images are taken from the IDP website. They have educational material, and it's uh, worth a while to, to study it. And the impression you get when you leave through this is we have a continuous involvement. So first, you have the traditional scrolls, and then you have different ways of putting folios together, because, uh, of course, uh, if you have a paper scroll, you have sheets of paper glued together. And then we have different ways of putting uh, folios together, and this one looks like this. Uh, so you, you glue the folios together. Uh, but it's, of course, not a book in, 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 in the sense of a codex. And then afterwards, after a certain time, uh, the codex came out, the stitched book or the thread-bound book. And actually, we have a few of these. It's rough paper. It does not compare neither in handwriting and the quality of paper with these sutras we have. These things supposedly, uh, the research here is just in the beginning. 
uh, are late uh, if you say basically the Dunhuang material is from 400 uh, through roughly 1030 or something like that. They m might be 8th, 9th century or something like that. There are not, not too many of them, but it's very clear that they went, were meant for personal use. Uh, they have uh, sometimes, uh, they have, so to speak, uh, for the priest performing something, they have the notes he needs in contrast to those very nice and very beautifully looking representative uh, sutras. Mm, the interesting thing is, and I will return to that later, that uh, we have another development which is also to be found on the website, but this uh, pertains to print, and uh, for print we have Professor Barrett from London, so I will uh, not comment on that. So very briefly, I sum this up and then I come to my last point. If we want to somewhat uh, tabulate this, we have uh, manuscripts, um, the earliest dated one, dated one is from 433 BCE, and that's a tomb inventory. Actually, most of the manuscripts, which are not administrative documents, are inventories. So literary manuscripts are rather a few. Uh, depends on how you count, and sometimes we have only one, one slip left, but uh, it's a few dozen, and, and that's about it. Inventories, we, are, we have more than 100. So they are mainly uh, from South China, and um, uh, some are literary. We have all the, uh, the, the supports uh, I just talked about. Then we have paper, in, and the language would correspond to Old Chinese. And then uh, we have roughly what uh, some of us call medieval, uh, from roughly 200 until 1200. Um, they were mainly excavated or found in uh, Central Asia, so it's a different uh, area. This has to be kept in mind. And um, we have Buddhist, uh, we have Buddhist texts, we have Taoist texts, Confucians. We have also administrative documents in this Dunhuang uh, cave, but uh, it's a minority of things. And the formats are scroll and codex. Please, uh, it's this sort of codex because Peter Gumbot would not accept that as codex, of course. And um, I will leave out um, the, the the modern type of uh, thread-bound book because it would would. Um, too complex, but I, I think that uh, Professor Barrett might, might talk about that. We have xylographic printing, so not typographical printing, but woodblock printing roughly beginning in 700. And then um, in uh, the letter phase, which is not uh, the topic today, but which should be included, as I will show you in a couple of minutes, um, we have mainly uh, calligraphy and uh, autographs. And uh, these are studied by the elite, by the, by the educated, and uh, they are somehow, they have a symbolical value because either uh, it's in a static uh, sense, it's valuable, or it's done by already very Western-like, it's done by Sushi, by the great poem or by the great statesman. And so because it's this authentic trace, so it is uh, revered and copied uh, by, by students. And here, of course, you have a multiplicity. Um, the so-called dialects of modern Chinese are, of course, mainly not dialects, but uh, languages. And uh, the Chinese government uh, is responsible for terming them, them um, uh, dialects. And you have a whole variety of things, and it becomes very, very uh, rich in differences in, 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 in almost every respect. But uh, there is very, very little research. We are doing an encyclopedia on, on Asian and African manuscript cultures, and it's extremely complicated to find anyone who really works on manuscripts. We have quite a few scholars who work on prints and sometimes look at manuscripts, but for the latter period, it's, it's, it's a pity. So we have um, uh, roughly in the 16th century, we have this new technique of xylographic printing, uh, catering to the demands of somewhat bourgeois uh, uh, readership, uh, which uh, we had an economic growth in there. And then in the late 19th century, we have uh, lithographic printing. I just mentioned this because if we are talking about manuscripts and manuscript cultures, you have to, to look at these techniques as well. Um, what I find interesting is that even if you look at a lithographic print from the early 20th century, it still basically is the same layout, the same way what we have seen uh, for, for, for 2,000 years earlier. So um, I will just run through this. Um, if, you, if, if you allow me to use the plural here for Chinese manuscript cultures, just a few points. It is very often regional with local production and restricted readership. We have religious manuscripts, um, in, we have sectarian, esoteric traditions, uh, just an image here. So these were, even after the invention of print, they were never printed in, by intention because it was esoteric knowledge. You, would only, you can restrict access to knowledge if you have manuscripts. 
because if you have as, 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 if, if you print 100 copies, it's very difficult to control them. Uh, if, if you have them in the storage, you get the key and take them out. But um, there are rituals for conveying uh, this knowledge. People have to copy themselves and uh, they, they will land in hell if they give it to anyone else. Professional is very important. This is somewhat related to, to esoterical things because it's, in a certain sense, a secret knowledge. Uh, people, doctors and others, they make money with the knowledge they have in the manuscripts. And so they are handed down in a very restrictive manner. Like this, it's different notary stuff. And then ethnic, um, uh, that's a very difficult field. I'll just give you one. It looks Chinese, but those of you reading Chinese will, uh, when, start, when starting reading, will find out it's not Chinese. Uh, that's drunk. It's a Dai language which is written with uh, Chinese characters. And uh, again, this is mainly religious uh, and ritual uh, stuff uh, for rituals which are close to Taoist uh, rituals, but uh, still uh, something uh, very local. Then we have the scholarly and literary circles, uh, which is something completely different. This is a copy of, of one of the manuscripts of the famous Honglo Meng, and you see again its scholarly commentary all over, and these were sometimes uh, circulated manuscripts for decades uh, before they were finally printed. So, and the final one is calligraphic, and this is a beautiful calligraphy by the Emperor Huizong. Uh, and um, uh, this is uh, very active until the present day. Uh, calligraphy is taught, uh, and you can uh, go to, to Busiban or can, can learn calligraphy. And so this is very active, not only in China, but in Korea, especially in Japan as well. So my final examples, and then I'm through it. I can cut it short. Do you remember this one? So this is from the 8th or 9th century, and as you see, uh, it's the type of thread-bound book or stitch book, and you see it's very rough paper. And um, if you look at this one, I apologize for the quality of the image. I was not able to get a better one. They are from the State Library in Munich. We had a project on the Yao uh, 20 years ago or so. And if you look at them, they look very similar. The binding is similar, I cannot show you here. The content is similar in a certain sense too. It's what they call fa yu. It's uh, the notes of a priest for performing rituals, but this one is not Buddhist, but it's Taoist. And the interesting thing is, these manuscripts are from the 19th century. So scholarly study has always been focusing on uh, this high-level uh, type of book, or whatever you want to call it. And research on this type of book has only recently uh, started. And this type of book um, has somewhat survived in the margins. These books were produced right into the 20th century. and uh, uh, that would be a very nice research project, but it's quite clear that, um, of course, the paper production is more primitive, so to speak. The quality of the paper is not so high that uh, this type of book uh, was not needed anymore in, in the cities or in the urban centers, but uh, it was still the ideal way for, uh, you know, for, for, for somewhat um, laying down this more or less esoteric knowledge in uh, the margins. So that's where the Yao live. It's, it's a small people, maybe two million altogether. And it's, again, very complicated who is a Yao and who is not. Uh, the Communist Party decided for China, but uh, there are others who say, well, maybe uh, it might be more complicated. That's only to give you an impression of the region. And these Yao have these things. This is not so artistic. Um, uh, I'll give you this one. This is much nicer. And uh, it scrolls six meters, eight meters. So it's volumina, so to speak. And they have panels, and they give you a myth um, beginning with the creation of the world, and it ends. Uh, then it goes through all the dynasties uh, of the Chinese Empire, and usually in the end, you have notes uh, concerning the family to which the scroll belongs. And this is very interesting. Why? It's Chinese, and it's more or less good Chinese. Sometimes it sounds more like Wang Donghua, but uh, Cantonese, and uh, but it's it's uh, all very Chinese. And the the illustrations you can trace back to printed books, by the way. So it is all very Chinese. But the format is very funny. This type of scroll you cannot find in the higher tradition in, in China anymore. But we have this sort of scrolls which are related to legit. Legitimation, legitimacy, and um, and and families uh, in Southeast Asia. So uh, we have that in, in mainland Southeast Asia, and it's quite clear. Uh, I would say that we here have an amalgam. So it's a sort of blending of, of two different traditions. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Richards.
Rich that was uh, giving us a ton of food for thought, and uh, we'll have brief questions now and then larger discussion this afternoon. I'd like to welcome our provost, Barry Butler. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome. Um, if, if I could uh, maybe start the conversation uh, by looking, well, first of all, the uh, typology you've given of semantics and pragmatics, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, as I mentioned, we're building a database and you know, hopefully an online resource. So we'd like to continue the conversation with you about probably, uh, I think it would make a lot of sense to adopt that typology. So uh, let's, uh, let's, start, uh, let's start that conversation. Uh, and then to go back to the manuscript definition, um, it seems like uh, you know there's this. If you if you read the Oxford Dictionary, there's a, a massive distinction between manuscript mm -hmm. versus print culture. But then the other distinction, which is there uh, and still is, I think, in your definition, is the portability issue. So uh, manuscript versus paper date. Uh, and I think that interface is something that we want to explore in the seminar. We also want to, in our database, include epigraphic, so non-portable, uh, and uh, see what kind of formats mm -hmm. that supports. And I think the, uh, where the interface gets confusing is you showed uh, one of the earliest examples of Chinese writing was the, the metal bowl. Uh, and so that would be, by your definition, a manuscript. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's, I'm talking as a classicist now and as somebody who works on the Mediterranean, um, the sort of inscriptions that you get in, uh, I guess, portable but non book uh, mm -hmm. things like dishes, mm -hmm. magic bowls, yeah. and, and Aramaic. Mm -hmm. Uh, that often will have uh, a, a closer kind of relationship to the inscriptions mm -hmm. than, than the manuscripts. But then uh, this is just to say uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, insights that could be gained by, by exploring that, that connection between you know, where, does, where does a manuscript end and an inscription mm -hmm. begin. But, it's interesting that the portability issue, I mean, that seems to be so foundational, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's a perfect keyword, and actually, uh, by chance, I have a few slides to, to, to highlight one of your points. Um, but of course, I mean, these uh, definitions, they are working definitions, and they are meant in a certain way to provoke. Sure. Um, so so uh, this is open to discussion. If you, have, if you say it's nonsense, and if you have a good argument, we might jettison it. But uh, we could not work, uh, actually, since we are, well, we are representing right now 20 disciplines in our center. And um, if we would start uh, discussing what is a manuscript, what is a book, using, uh, let's say, what uh, Europeans have been doing, uh, we will not get very far. Then, uh, to take a detour, uh, if you look at the palm leaves, uh, they, are, they are incised. So, uh, according to some people, you would have to say they are, uh, it's not manuscripts, it's epigraphy. And um, so um, it is very difficult for the pot. Uh, yeah, we might talk about that, but uh, I will not uh, go back to the definition, but applied by hand. And of course, what does it mean? Uh, if, if you cast a bronze vessel in the end, it's always the human hand, but this is probably not what was meant. Uh, you have a manuscript uh, model, and then it is somehow by a second, uh, by the cast or by, by someone, uh, an artisan, it is put uh, it's in a model and then afterwards it's cast. So uh, I would say I would be able to, to counter that argument. But uh, of course you are completely right. Where is, especially if you have in, in the Islamic world, you have lots of vessels where, where you have little things in China, by the way, as well, and in, in the Mediterranean, of course. And um, of course that's very difficult, but um, if you consider the manuscript as something to be meant uh, for uh, having text in it, then, uh, the vessel might be a bit more difficult because that would be secondary. The vessel is still meant to store things or to drink out of a cup or, or whatsoever. But of course, this is open to discussion. Maybe let's let. No, this is this is what I will not talk about. You might uh, ask the other professor. This is also something I will not talk about. Yeah, this one. Um, 
you will in a, in a minute understand what I mean. Um, the question is, what is the difference between manuscripts and epigraphy? First, our essoriologist, uh, Cécile Michel from CNRS in Paris, she gave an inspiring talk when we had our uh, conference on epigraphy and manuscripts. And she explained to us why uh, cuneiform tablets are called, uh, considered as epigraphy. And uh, basically her argument was, um, it was archaeologists who were studying uh, texts in cuneiform writing. And they had inscriptions in, in other places. Uh, they had inscriptions in, in statues, in, in temples, and other things. And so this was lumped together with the cuneiform writing. And uh, she had a plaidoyer uh, that it should be that the tablets should be considered as manuscripts. That's for one. But the interesting thing is, if you have to draw a dividing line, um, we would suggest something else. And this is, of course, uh, something which I did not talk about. In many cultures, and the Indian one is very helpful in this sense, you do not have opposites. You do not have, let's say, manuscripts here and uh, something, uh, inscription on a mountain uh, as the opposite. You have a sort of a continuum. And um, for example, for Indian uh, inscriptions up to the recent past, it is quite clear that you do not only have uh, manuscripts, that means birch bark for a long time in the northwest and palm leaves, uh, on the one hand, and stone inscriptions, which you have from the Buddhist side, Ashoka, the, the early ones, uh, the huge inscriptions, or in cave temples, uh, just like in Dongfang and other places, you have inscriptions, but you have something in between, and that's uh, the copper plates. And these are highly interesting. Why? Uh, copper, as you know, it's, it's metal, so it's very durable, much more durable than palm leaves, but on the <laughs> other hand, it's a soft metal, so it's easier to inscribe than uh, you would have, uh, let's say, steel or, or something like that. And uh, you have, and this is of course also relevant, uh, you, there seems to be a certain distribution of, let's say, genres or whatever you want to call it. Um, for example, what you put into stone, it's usually of some importance. It's uh, kingly or it's uh, of, of a family who wants to, to eternalize uh, their name by giving uh, to a community or whatsoever. While um, uh, the manuscripts usually do not contain these texts. They are texts meant to be displayed publicly and to, to leave a lasting impression. And these copper plates, they are maybe not exclusively, it's not my field, I learned from my colleagues, they are mainly for legal texts, for documents, for, for, for contracts. And so um, they were kept together in Nepal, they were used until the early 20th century. And um, it is not clear, there, there are not so many scholars studying that. There is one project which started recently uh, doing that. But it's quite clear that these were meant as tangible evidence of this contract. And one would still like to think uh, that this contract was not thought of and from your mind immediately put on copper, but that there was an intermediate stage for the manuscript. And the same might hold true for inscriptions as well. I mean, for Chinese uh, epigraphy, it's quite clear I, no, I don't have this with me here. Um, if you look, uh, Lothar Lederose has worked on that. If you know his book, uh, 10,000 Things, um, you, there is in the beginning something about bronze inscriptions and stone inscriptions, and you can, you, you can find something from that. It is quite clear if you look at inscriptions and you know the Chinese uh, stone carvers, they are amazing. They do things just like uh, the, the calligrapher with a brush. And it is quite clear. Um, which he has shown by using um, a chapter of the Bayanjing in stone that uh, there was a manuscript uh, model for that. Because he, he was looking, I think, in this image on, on the Shi Jie, that means world, something like that, which comes uh, on that uh, stone, I think it's at least 20 times or 30 times, and every time it's different. So they're really trying to copy the individual traits of the manuscript. And so I would say uh, your point is completely right, but maybe it is not so helpful in the end to say, here's a clear dividing line, but uh, to, to open up a field and say maybe uh, you have extremes. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, then you would have something in a huge dimension on a mountain, which is supposed to stay there uh, until uh, the kalpa goes to its end. And on the other hand, the perishable things, which are only meant maybe for dealing uh, with a certain affair, and then you throw it away. So it's, uh, I would say ladies first in this sense, not least. I was just going to say, I've seen some of those in uh, Karnataka also. Yeah. So um, the whole issue of all those thousands of Buddhist sutras that don't appear, that appear to be new. Uh, when I was in Japan, we went and stayed in Buddhist monasteries, mm -hmm. and they would hand us a sutra that had printed 
uh, outlines that we were to copy, regardless of whether we understood them. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a Japanese person could tell that our calligraphy was not good, mm -hmm. trying to fill in the blanks. I don't think anything like that existed in medieval Europe. Mm -hmm. Any manuscript mm -hmm. was copied, you had to understand the language in mm -hmm. order to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a very interesting difference mm -hmm. that religion makes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I mean it's uh, this, uh, as you said, uh, the the value is not in whether you understand anything, but in the object itself. Yes. And um, of and course. Going I, to the efforts. Yeah, yeah, and you don't even have to do it yourself. I mean, you can pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. They didn't I'm, tell us that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, in the colophon, many in these, of these colophons, you have the scribe noting down he was doing it for this one, and he used so much paper because they probably they were paid according to the to the uh, length of, of, of the text, and uh, so it's quite clear that uh, you could do it this way. Um, yeah, this is fascinating. And the Japanese, of course, uh, I would say. Uh, uh, the average Japanese would not understand what he or she is copying either. No, I was with a scholar and he mm. would say these characters are from the original Sanskrit in Chinese and I can't read them. Thank you. I was going to ask, um, the rubrics on the Latin uh, manuscripts, it seemed to me, uh, what, is the, what, is, what is their source? It looks very much like, like uh, author or whoever was laying out this manuscript was trying to reproduce the form of a man's uh, slip manuscript. Is that where they come from? And the same was on the Junhuang uh, uh, paper manuscript as well. It's the one that they were ruling. Yeah, you mean the ruling? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in many cases it's not red, but it, uh, we have a very early specimen of uh, the, the ruling being in red. I mean, that's, that's what everybody thinks, but uh, of course, uh, one might think of other reasons. Uh, but looking at the material evidence, it would still be the easiest explanation. And um, I mean, I think uh, you recommended uh, Chen Sun Chun's book on, on, on written on bamboo and so, and he is discussing this as well. Uh, but what does it mean? And the direction of uh, writing was not uh, in this sense fixed in the beginning. On the oracle bones you have it uh, left to right, right to left, uh, so, so everything is possible. And even in some bronze inscriptions you have uh, Busto, what's the name, Busto Fedon. Uh, you, so it's, it's going like this. And um, so at least at a very early stage you could still play with the directions. And um, but but uh, this must have been been uh, related to the production somehow. I mean uh, that at a certain stage the script was adopted to the slip, or the slip uh, adopted itself to the script. Uh, we don't have ev evidence, and the problem is uh, if we would have a manuscript from the same time as we have the, 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 those bone inscriptions, then we might be able to to say something definite. But uh, as you have seen, the first dated manuscript is 433. That's, uh, well, let's say 750 years later. So it's very diffi difficult, but in the bronze inscriptions, in most of them, it's already um, top bottom and right to left. And so this seems to, to, to be a very basic scheme, which has only been changed. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but there are so few that they really should consider should be considered to be ex exceptions. But this has only been changed when, um, in the 20th century, you know, the Western techniques came with the punctuation and all that. And uh, so this is a very, let's say, a very, a very, how to say, sedimented uh, tradition. It's, it's very strong. And um, it's still the easiest explanation that writing had to be in these columns and that they had to be differentiated, not only scribble. Of course, we have in the Dunhuang stuff and in later manuscripts, you have manuscripts without any ruling and it looks chaotic, just like my own notes. But um, uh, in order, and these silk manuscripts, of course, were something precious, and uh, one would not um, uh, dabble with it. So, of course, everything had to be orderly and nice. But uh, as you say, probably it's this way, but uh, let's wait until uh, the archaeologists find new material, and then we have to rethink the whole method. So, unfortunately, we're going to have to cut the Q&A short because we all need to have lunch, and then uh, 1 o'clock, uh, Shoshana is going to be presenting. So uh, please join me again in thanking our speaker.